Hello, and welcome to another U.S. Tech Workers podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Lynn. I'm also the founder of U.S. Tech Workers and the executive director of Progressives for Immigration Reform. And today is June 18th, 2020. And this is a special show because I have John Miano, attorney and author, returning to us to talk about the SCOTUS decision, the Supreme Court of the United States decision, on DACA, formerly known as DHS versus Regents of the University of California. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Great, it's great to be back here again, Kevin. Right on. Well, everyone loves it when you're here. And John, you know, when we look at the decision of uh, on DACA, it kind of leaves us scratching our heads for a few reasons. As I know, The one case that you're involved in, there could be some things, had this outcome been different or I'm not sure different or something either gone a different way or maybe it does impact, doesn't, but there's a case you're working on where that it could have been impacted by this decision. So I was hoping you could kind of summarize for our audience what this decision was and what impact it can have for our tech workers here in the United States. Okay, Ken. Well, the first thing we can say here is that this decision was a decision not to decide or to decide very little. Uh, so, and we will probably get into that more. The other right. thing is that uh, tech workers dodged a bullet on this decision because a lot of uh, programs that affect tech workers um, share common attributes with the DACA program. Um, the DACA can only be legal if these programs that are used to screw American tech workers were, le- le- were legal. Now, these would be some of the EAD, the employment authorization uh, cases or issues or permits that are out there like H4 EAD, correct? correct. H4 EAD, OPT, International Entrepreneurial. There's, there's a whole slew of them. And in fact, more um, aliens are coming into the job market every year through these regulations than are authorized by Congress. And they compared to the ones that are authorized by Congress, like H- H-1B. Uh, so if the Supreme Court had said that, yes, yes DACA is legal, uh, American tech workers and American workers in general would just been totally screwed. I mean, this would have been but so they didn't say that they didn't say you know daca is legal we need to move forward with the executive order what did they say because obviously it, it would appear from what i'm reading uh let me just pull up one article here uh, from the hill uh where you know Supreme Court blocks Trump plan to end DACA program. Now, you would think that as a result, uh, Trump would be angry, and he seems to be, because it says here, Trump blasted the ruling as politically motivated and an affront to conservative values. These horrible and politically charged decisions coming out of the Supreme Court are a shotgun blast in the face of people that are proud and call themselves Republicans and conservatives. Now, is that is there something? Is this a nothing burger for him to get angry about? Um, in a sense, <laughs> it's hard. In a sense, yes, he should be angry, and um, in other sense, he should be shouldn't be angry. But on the other hand, he should be angry at him at himself as well because a large part of this mess is caused by his own DHS. You know, Trump didn't put someone like Chris Kobach running DHS. And I can be sure you, if Kobach had been running DHS, this mess would not have, not have occurred. The defense of the DACA rescission 
has been totally incompetent. It has been sabotaged by the deep state the entire um, the entire way. And mm -hmm. on the political, in a sense, he's right about politics. And even Justice Thomas noted that. Um, he said, Justice Thomas wrote, today's decision must be recognized for what it is, an effort to avoid a political controvers politically controversial but legally correct decision. Okay. So and is that kind of, in I'm sorry, go ahead, John, and then I'll. Well, what I'll say, say here is that this is, this is all politics. I mean, this is, you know, um, whenever I go, before, go to my local um, planning board for meetings, you know, we have people want to build something near us or whatever, okay? You have 12 guys. There's one guy on the planning board who always has to hyperanalyze everything. You know, left doesn't mean left, up doesn't mean up. You know, there's one guy, he, he just has to hyperanalyze to, to show how smart he is. Uh, John Roberts is that guy. He's, oh really? Yeah, I mean he's hyper. He's playing political games and hyper hyper analyzing this. So the effect here is his opinion says that they didn't give the DHS the government did not give sufficient um, explanation for why they're rescinding this. Okay. Now the government said that um, to their reason for rescinding was that it was unlawful. Yet they didn't address that. They're saying, well, you got to address some other stuff. You know, um, as the dissenters note, like Thomas, if it's unlawful, they should have been able to just do it for that reason. So he's added that, this. We've got to, you've got to explain, you've got to explain why it's unlawful. Plus, you've got to explain all the effect on the work workers. Now, look, look, look how this uh, works out in a um, in the prosecutorial discretion area. And this was billed as prosecutorial prosecutorial discretion. We're not going to. Um, prosecute these people because of priorities. Now, what's right? What's it was a, two of those priorities. One, they didn't take into account the impact, the personal impact on the DACA's. Right. But now that that could be said for any pro, bit of prosecutorial discretion. You know, you go out there and a um, administration says, we're not going to prosecute the importation of pot. Some guy brings in a ton of pot and pot and another guy, um, no, next president says, we're going to start prosecuting pot. And this guy had, now has a warehouse full of pot. Well, the president didn't consider his illegal importation of pot. It is so absurd that you can't, you can't imagine. And it's, it just makes a mess of the law, but it's a political dodge here. So in order to avoid getting into the question of whether DAC is legal, he said, uh, Roberts is saying, well, they got to say more. And then the other key piece of this is that what's happening now is the case is, the case is being remanded to DHS to consider the problem anew, okay? So this right. issue is- Right, they're in the up. opinion on page 29. <laughs> I just pulled the screen up for everyone. It reads, that dual failure raises doubts about whether the agency appreciated the scope of its discretion or exercised that discretion in a reasonable manner. The appropriate recourse is therefore to remand to DHS so that it may consider the problem anew. So we've had this case, you know, it's gone to the lower courts, gets all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme, you know, Guys, you're the big man. We appoint, we, you get the big share and lifetime appointment so you can make the big decisions. And they've decided not to decide. Send it back and start it all over so we can have, we can, we can run this whole legal um, charade over and over again. Uh, it, it's, just, it, it's outrageous, not, it's not conservative versus liberal outrageous. This is just from rational, you know, rationally functioning legal system um, outrage. Because, frankly, myself, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic, certainly empathetic to the plight of many of these DACA folks who came here at a very young age through, you know, no fault of their own, ended up being, you know, they, they fall, fall into this group of being here as illegal immigrants. And, you know, I would appreciate seeing a pathway to citizenship. At the same time, I think we should be able to enforce some constraints on that privilege. You know, we, you know, 
that we've kind of come out of family unification issues. For instance, they couldn't turn around and sponsor their parents and other relatives from abroad, things like that. Certainly allowing them, giving them green cards and allowing them to work and earn a living and live peaceably here in the United States. I'm, I would be fine with that. My issue is that now it sounds like, John, from what you're telling me, we really don't know where we stand. We're gonna go round robin on this again. That, that's it. The Supreme Court has just created, created chaos. And, you know, this is more important. This decision is bigger for what wasn't decided than what was decided. Um, when, another issue that was that had been raised is the question of nationwide injunctions. You know, can er, any one of 700 um, federal judges, you know, block some administration act, action, you know, the, which uh, brings, you know, to the forum shopping. Um, and it's, the opinion specifically says, well, we don't decide, don't decide that. So all they've, all they've decided is this really dubious thing that, uh, question that they, have, that they have to provide more information. And so it's clear that what Roberts is doing is um, coming up with, is trying to find a path where I don't have to decide and can, can just punt, which is a stupid thing. And do the you, other you thing- think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'll give you another key thing that's going on here. There's a, you know, there are at least three cases that were wait, waiting for a decision on this that I know of. Um, you know, and what are those, John? Well, there are two of mine, the H4AD and the OPT, plus closer to what's going on here is Texas versus United States, which is actually challenging whether DACA is lawful. And so that case is just sitting there waiting for the Supreme Court to decide. So now we can have now, now the uh, action switch, shifts to Texas, where we can have a court saying, oops, DACA's over because it's unlawful. You know, it, so the Supreme Court has just created an uh, utter mess. I mean, this is just, this is judicial incompetence. I mean, we, we have to say what it is. This is judicial incompetence. Wow, and do you think that's because, John, when you look at the composition of the Supreme Court, these are more, academic prone, these are more ivory tower type folks as opposed to judges that have come up through a prosecutorial uh, system where they were trying, you know, in, you know, in the weeds, trying cases, criminal cases, things like that. Well, there does seem to be a, a distinct lack of common sense, sense here. I mean, one of the things I've encountered in the legal system that, that, that people outside have a hard time appreciating is that the federal courts uh, focus on deciding not to decide. Okay? So, you know, normally in your, in your work, you're trying to accomplish goals. You're trying to um, put a product out. You're trying to accomplish something in your, in your work. Uh, and so uh, people, I think, would naturally think that, that in the courts that they're trying to move cases along. You know, a case comes in, it's a project, it's gotta be completed and we're gonna get the case out the door. And in reality, they court, the instinct of the courts is to drag, drag things out, decide absolutely as little as possible. I mean, there are many times where I've been in a, you know, been before court and you're just where the question for the court is, should you move forward or, or find some reason for delay? And every time after you go to those hearings, we get in the get in the taxi cab and we laugh because we know any time you give a federal court chance to the chance to delay, they're usually going to they're usually going to take delay. And so, like in the case of the um, um, H4ED case, that case has gone on for over five and a half years now. Okay? And this isn't any piece of anything complicated. It's a question of is this legal? Now, on the other hand, remember the, that case was filed before any of these DACA cases. The right. court allowed the challenges to the Trump administration to fly through, you know, at, at lightning speed. But, but these not your case. You know, but the but the H four AD case um, progresses at a at a snail's pl snail's pace, and right now it's it's still waiting for a decision from the court whether to delay or not. Um, now, question for you, John: Had this decision been different? Had they said that? you know, granting DACA the status, granting this DACA status, this would have, uh, this would be unlawful. Mm -hmm. How would that have played into your H4EAD and OPT cases, your optional practical training cases? 
Well, that would effectively have ended them but you know in their favor of american workers okay this which is why you see all these business groups on the side of daca because they mm -hmm. know that if the court says daca is unlawful it's going to take away their ability to use regulations to bring in foreign workers okay you know it's not you, they they kind of allows them to pretend like we're um you know supporting the little the billionaires can say we're supporting the little guys but in actuality it's self it's self-serving and on the flip side, had the had, had they they said the DACA was legal, um, which of course they didn't, um, American workers would have been totally screwed because that every protection for American workers in the immigration system um, could could be um, dismantled through regulation. But so, oh, go what's ahead. What's is drag out. The OPT case, I mean, that's gone on now for twelve and a half years. Okay. And these are, and this is not a case where we complex litigation. This is a simple case of is this legal? Is this regulation legal? You would think, you know, you get an opinion from the judge. Yeah, I think it's legal. Or, no, I don't think it's legal. The other side appeals, uh, and then it's decided. You know, a year, maybe two, two years. Instead, there've been f five appeals already. I think it is one, two, three, four, five. You know, it just goes back and forth as little as nothing gets decided, just like we see here in this DACA case. Now, um, it goes back to DHS, come up, um, we'll come up with another, another um, explanation why it's wrong. If um, these guys have any competence, it'll be a 50 page document of all the things they're considered saying why it's um, unlawful, not something like Kristen Nielsen did, which was totally incompetent. Um, it'll be a co comprehensive explanation of why, it, why it's unlawful. They'll bring it. There'll be 50 more lawsuits brought up across the country. Um, at least one of the judges is going to say that it's going to block it, and we're going to go through this cycle all again. My There's gosh. Now, this is a DHS that's run by Chad Wolf. Right. Our wolf in sheep's clothing. What do you think the chances are of him acting uh, on the on the behalf of the American workers, um, not good. And you know, one of the reasons, um, one of the problems is that they need to control the DHS bureaucracy. Okay, because when when a court case is brought against an agency, okay, the Department of Justice serves as the attorney, okay, as the representative attorney. But the um, DHS lawyers drive the defense. You know, tell them what they got, got to say. Okay. The defense of the DACA decisions has been totally sabotaged the entire entire step of the way. I mean, it's not, um, it's absolutely incompetent. Uh, there's on the um, Court of Appeals website for the um, DC circuit, there's an oral argument um, for one of these cases that, um, where the, you can hear the Justice Department lawyer um, making, making arguments on why they're sending DACA and it's totally embarrassing. Now, <laughs> It kind of makes it look like the, like the Justice Department lawyer is incompetent, but in reality, uh, but to be fair, he's like, it's like when I've represented friends in traffic cases and had to stand before the judge and explain why, uh, why they were going 25 miles an hour, going 50 miles in a 25 zone. You know, the judge doesn't, right. doesn't try to make a fool out of the client. He makes fun of the lawyer who's, you know, you know, that's their job to stand up. Mm -hmm. So the Justice Paul lawyer is just, I mean, I, I feel sorry for him, but, but people are going to want, are going to say this is incompetent. But then when you read, listen to the other side, you know, the legal issues come out and, and um, you can see the big problems, problems with DACA. The, um, the defense, okay, all along, okay, that's been maintained is that the decision to rescind DACA is not reviewable, okay? Like everyone knew that wasn't going to fly, okay? I mean, that would be like if the President of the United States put out a policy that I'm not, gonna, not going to um, prosecute any criminals, that such a policy wouldn't be reviewable. I mean, it, it's so utter, utterly absurd. Every court has rejected that argument on both sides, you know, the ones that have been for and against DACA have rejected it. If that was the main argument they've used throughout the entire DACA litigation and to the Supreme Court, I mean, it is utterly laughable. And so they served up, you know, for the Supreme Court to go against them. Okay? 
So are we are we justified to be very frustrated with the Trump administration and a lot of these executive orders doing this as opposed to going through policy, getting, as you mentioned earlier, the right people to head these agencies? You know, that's the, the great frustration of Trump is he hasn't put the right people in place. And this is shocking because you think, you know, a guy who's been in business, you know, would know that the key thing is to get people, good people on, who are on your team um, to do um, to do your mission, who are going to support you. And, and I don't mean lackeys. You know, I mean, people, right. you need people who stand up and say, President, you're wrong. But when the president says, no, but this is what I want to do, they'll say, okay. Not, you know, uh, not go and write a 500 page book on why the president is um, an idiot, okay? Uh, you know, back and backstab them. I, mean, I've, I spoke, spoke uh, last year to a person in the White House who said, you know, we don't. We have no idea who uh, anonymous is because I know a hundred people who it could be, you know, they, because he <laughs> skilled his administration with people who under undermine him from head to toe, um, and so and this is the res, and this is the result. Right. And I know people like Ann Coulter have been very very critical of him for that. And you know we're right as this decision has just come out today. We're looking for him to come out with a revision to his executive order because they're coming up on that 60 days, and the hope is that he will add employment visas to uh, the the you know the, the ban. You know the the battle cry has been to expand the ban, but. What, at this point, it's hard to tell what we can expect from them because, again, there's so many people in that administration that don't seem to have hold the values of what he ran on in 2016. No, um, and when Breitbart wrote that uh, when it was being a meeting with the president, somebody in the meeting said, you know, if we expand this to employment, uh, it'll upset Tim Cook. Well, my God, first, you know, Donald Trump, we elected you because we thought you were the guy who was going to stand up for the Tim Cooks of the world. And second, how is someone like that even in the White House who's sitting there representing the interests of Tim exactly. Cook? You don't have anyone in, I mean, Donald Trump, you don't have anyone representing the interests of American workers, okay? You know, the people who elected you, they do not have a voice in your administration. You don't have a representative of those. But you have a lackey for Tim Cook right there with your ear, get, who can yell into your ear. You know, that is the problem. And this is, this is the problem that he faces in re-election. I mean, go back four years ago. I mean, I, I remember before my congressional test before, this, before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which I said, you know, it looks like the only thing that's going to solve this H-1B problem is, is executive action by Donald Trump. Nothing's happened. Uh, four years ago, among my Republican friends, all but one were actively supporting Trump. And you could ask them, why are you support? I would, and it's kind of a game. I would ask them, you know, why are you supporting Trump? You know, knowing his obvious flaws. And they would, and everyone I knew would say, yeah, I know the flaws, but I hope, but our hope is that he's going to do something about it. Yeah. Um, but now we, we got the flaws and we don't see the, you know, see what people were expecting was going to happen. And I look four years, four years now, and there's the enthusiasm was for Trump four years ago doesn't exist among, at least among my circles. I mean, I'm sure there are circles that have, have support for Trump, you know, at the rallies, but among the people that I deal with, the tech workers, the enthusiasm for Trump has just vanished. Right. You know, myself, I didn't vote for him and I didn't vote for Hillary Rodden Clinton. I, uh, withheld my vote on the two major parties. And I think I voted for Jill Stein of the Green Party because you know, sometimes for your vote to mean something, it's gotta be withheld, I feel. But at the same time, I had hoped that the policies would be better than the man. Now, th there's that amazing book called The Fall of the Public Man. And he talks about just this in a democracy. What are you looking for? Well, you're not looking for likability you're looking for someone who will get the job done at the end of the day. And that's the problem with American politics. We, we're more concerned about what's going on in someone's bedroom than we are in what's going on in the boardroom, you know, there in, in the Oval Office. And that's tragic. Yeah. Oh, and then look what we have now. I mean, I mean, Trump was running against the most corrupt person to run for, in history to run for um, president in 2016. Um, you know, maybe John C. Fremont could 
you could give her a bunch <laughs> of money, but um, but at least it was it, it was a two horse race. And so now in this election, we you know, the public knows something's wrong. We see the big Bernie Sanders movement. You know, people know that something is wrong in the political system. But in the Democrat Party, the establishment fought back. And so now Trump is running against a kleptocrat um, who with obvious, obvious mental impairment. You know, it's right. So uh, it's hard to predict what this what this will happen with this election, because, uh, you know, I, while the enthusiasm for Trump is gone and I'm sure that he's the that, that people who voted for him before aren't going to turn out. Um, the enthusiasm problems me the same on the other side because he's running against another total crook. Um, so <laughs> what's, what's going to, you know, this is going to be kind of, is going to be an interesting election, but, you know, maybe, maybe Trump is going to get the message, you know, and, you know, we have, um, how many months, you know, it's June, July, August, September, October. We got four full months now to the election. Trump has time to do some of these bold actions to take. To really, uh, I'll give you an example, John, of something that's playing out on the ground right now he could get involved in. In the Tennessee Valley Authority, they are outsourcing hundreds of tech worker jobs. In fact, on June 3rd, they laid off 64 people. Over 100 more will get laid off later this summer. And the work is going to the usual H-1B dependent firms. And literally Trump, it's a fed, quasi federal agency. Trump could get involved and stop that, stop it today, stop it permanently. Yeah. But yeah. where is Trump? I don't well, I mean, one of the problems that Trump has in this regard is he doesn't have a voice of that. He doesn't have a Kevin Lynn in the White House who has- John Mano in the White House. <laughs> okay, one of the two, you okay. You know, somebody who has an ear to, you know, what's going on with average working Americans, okay? You know, you and I know that because we're, we're speaking with average working Americans. You know, I'm not, I don't have, I don't have many conversations with billionaires. I have work, I, I converse with people who, um, you know, work nine to five, have more use than they're paying in sending kids to co college type. But Trump doesn't have anyone like that in the White House to funnel his, um, to funnel the message to him and to say, gosh, you know, look what's going on with Tennessee Valley Authority. This, this, is what, this is what concerns ordinary working Americans. Instead, he has someone to tell him what would upset Tim Cook sitting in the White House. So- Right, exactly, yep. It's ironic because in 2016, he did a rally in Huntsville, Alabama, and he had a couple folks from Disney who had been displaced you know, had to train their H-1B replacements. And that's that. Yeah. Um, I bet you if not one of them has been, I bet you not one of them has been to the White House to speak, let alone to speak with Trump about this and what could be done in the future on it. No, none have. Well, John, that's about all the time we have today. But uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, informing us as to what this decision was, or probably more apt to say what this decision wasn't <laughs> at the end of the day. So, but again, John, thanks for coming on. Uh, for our audience, if you are watching this on YouTube, be sure to give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed, be sure to subscribe because, hey, uh, that way you get informed right away when we post new content. Uh, so be sure also to visit our website, sign up for our newsletter. Every Friday, a newsletter comes out roughly right around 4.30 p.m. every Friday, Eastern Standard Time. So it's a good way to stay involved and active in this movement. Again, have a great day and Kevin Lynn signing off.